Toronto. I am first man Rastafari living here in the tropical island of Jamaica. You're going to be having a very special wake and bake moment with Captain Huta right there in your homes. Yeah, man, take care of Captain Huta and give it to the world as best as you can. It's Captain Huda. Good morning, everyone. How are you? I'm back. I missed you guys. I was just getting a little rest. Getting ready for another season of some incredible interviews. I have a really wonderful interview to show you today. Really gonna enjoy this young man. Someone who really has the right amount of motivation and inspiration and experience to make something happen. Wouldn't this be cool if you could start your day each day just kind of hanging out here? Oh, we're going to do some breathing. I like this part. Dude, I'm getting a serious head rush. I don't know about you guys. <laughs> Let's take a ride. Everyone, Hooter here, back after an amazing, wonderful, and relaxing vacation. And I'm back in Amsterdam, back feeling strong, just finished doing the Jack Hair Cup. And while I was there at the Jack Hair Cup, I had a chance to run into a couple of masters. And one of them is right here, Patrick Stevens, industry insider master. How are you, sir? I'm doing fine. Thank you for having me, Captain. Dude, you you really helped me out a great deal. Uh, while I was there at the Cup, I was getting input and information about the uh, so-called, quote-unquote, experiment that was growing on here in, in Amsterdam while I've been on my little vacation. And boy, did I get lucky and I ran into you. You're yeah. right in the middle of all of this. <laughs> yeah, yeah Dude, exactly. Yeah, I, I was... love it. I have, to, I have to admit, I was at the Jack Carrera Cup because I was like, you know, when you're being part of the experiment, when you're going to be part of like the, the first genuine legal cannabis production in the Netherlands, it's, it's kind of interesting also to know, okay, what are the flavors of today? You know, what are the trends towards which kind of genetics and strains are we going? You know, where are, are there any prominent shops that stick out uh, as opposed to others? And 
you know, do a little bit of networking. Yeah, and 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 then also by coincidence, I stumbled uh, uh, upon you. Uh, we, Amazing. We haven't, we haven't met each other no, person yet before, but but it was a it was absolutely an interesting evening. Thank you very much for that. <laughs> it was a fantastic time. Now, I have a lot of people here that are from North America, from the United States. They know of the generalities about Amsterdam. And, you know, they know that they can come here and they can come and smoke weed and they can buy weed at all of these different coffee shops. They've read my books. Those who are following me around understand that, you know, weed is still technically illegal here um, exactly. and that there's still this strange uh, backdoor policy. Can you explain to everyone a little bit about where this stands right now and how does this experiment, experiment factor yeah. into all of this? Yeah, okay. So, so in, indeed, it's true that in the Netherlands, you know, you can have weed on you, five grams, you can smoke it. At some places, you can smoke it in public. Uh, um, it's you don't need a medical recipe for something uh, for it or anything. It's just basically recreational use has been uh, tolerated for the last uh, approximately 40 years. But the weird thing is, they said, okay, listen, we don't want to, you know, the, the drug consumer in the Netherlands is not something they're after. You know, they are, they are more focusing on dealers and production and stuff like that. And weed was like, okay, you know what, this is not really uh, specifically dangerous for public health. So, you know what, if people want to buy it, if people want to have it, if people want to smoke it, okay, we're not going to uh, prosecute them. But the coffee shop that is selling the weed, he has a very peculiar predicament because basically he has to buy the stuff on the black market because the production is illegal. You know, if, if, if I want to grow weed in my home just for myself, let's say four plants and I hang a light and I put some nutrients and I grow some, some buds or whatever, the police catches me, I get a, a fine. And uh, I get probably I get from tax company. I'll uh, maybe I have to pay extra money because I was commercially cultivating something that I could make money with. And in the worst case, they kick you out of, of out of your house, so you're homeless, and then you're blacklisted, and you will not be able to rent another house or maybe buy another house or something like that. So, so we are in a situation where basically everybody's smoking weed, everybody's rolling up. You know, people are exchanging buds with each other, and. Uh, uh, all the production of these buds is basically illegal and the people that do it they not, not like in the us or in canada where you basically you grow some weed you sell it to a coffee shop you send them an invoice and he'll pay you by bank or something like that that's that's not the case so okay. we have this we have this legal facade on the outside but the supply towards the shop is basically the black market so it's a, it's a very strange compromise that was made because essentially how does a shop do his tax return if he doesn't have any invoices from the weed that, has, that he has been selling? At the same time, how does he know that the weed he is selling has a good quality and doesn't have any pesticides in it or heavy metals? If, it, if it's well flushed, is it really the genetics that you are uh, saying that it is? So... Uh, somewhere, I think about 20 years ago, we had some like left-wing government uh, uh, political parties that said, hey, listen, this whole backdoor situation is completely stupid. Because essentially what we're doing is we're forcing a coffee shop to use cash money, black market money, to pay for something and then sell it legally uh, onto a market. So uh, we don't want black money. We want white money. We want money to be able to be taxed and stuff like that. So uh, how, can, how can we deal with the situation? How can we basically protect consumers of cannabis uh, uh, from buying bad quality stuff that has been sprayed with, you know, over the last Anything. 10, 20 years, we've had the most ridiculous stuff found in weed, you know, uh, neon tubes, uh, uh, silver sand, sunflower oil, sugar water, hash spray, there's, there, so, so they said, okay, listen, the back door, we have to do something about it. And uh, there were some good plans, uh, you know, saying like, like you have a system, I think, uh, in the US or in Canada, it's, it's similar where basically a dispensary, or no, the social club in Spain is a good example, where basically a social club cultivates its own weed right. for the members of their club. Mm -hmm. So this was a bit of the idea, okay, you know, for, for example, you have in the town where I live in Eindhoven, there's like 10 shops, 
the 10 shops basically have their own farm where they cultivate their own weed legally, you know, and that you can track and trace it and everything. Uh, and then they will sell it in the shop. That was the idea. But then, uh, unfortunately, there came new elections and the Christian Democrats took over. And they are com they're completely anti-drugs. The Christian Democrats basically said the only thing you need to get high up is your belief in God. Yeah. Yeah, so... I mean, yeah. they're, 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 they also don't support heavy drinking or heavy smoking or, or prostitution or whatever, you know. It's basically yeah. the, the, only, the only thing that you should get a positive feeling from is, is your belief, okay? Right. That's, if you want to think that, that's no problem at all. But essentially, uh, uh, so 20 years ago, we could have changed the situation and we did not. And in the last years, there is basically, we have like a, a stalemate between left-wing parties and right-wing parties uh, uh, where, where one side says, we don't want to do anything. We prefer to have less coffee shops instead of more. And other parties that are saying, hey, listen, let's regulate this finally. You know, let's make sure that this, this thing is settled. And because they could not come to uh, an agreement, they said, okay, let's do a compromise. Let's simply do an experiment uh, for a period of four years time where we will have 10 licensed cultivators, 10 farms and 10 cities. And in all those 10 cities, a total of uh, uh, 40, uh, 74 shops will participate in an experiment where 10 companies produce legal cannabis that has been, that has been checked for, for heavy metals and stuff, 100% uh, uh, legal. And they can sell this weed with an invoice to those coffee shops. And then okay, now, real quick, let me let me just ask you something real quick. All weed in Netherlands, in general, is is illegal. Not illegal. is is right, but is not tested for no no no. no. And, no that's that's and actually it, that's it's forbidden. It's forbidden. It's forbidden. Exactly. If, if you if you send a, a, if you're a coffee shop, you say, hey, listen, I want I, I, I I don't I want to know if there's heavy metals inside or pesticides or whatever. And you take a sample and you send it to a bureau, uh, which they, they are there are laboratories in Hong where you can test substances, mm -hmm. but then you are trafficking. You are sending an illegal <laughs> substance by post to uh, to a, 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 an official institution, which is not allowed. You know, you can have you can you can get you can get devices yourself where you can test THC levels, CBD levels. In a lot of cases, you can also maybe find contamination and stuff like that, but to have an official test by an official laboratory objectively is not allowed in the Netherlands. Yeah. We used, we used well, to have a 20, 20 years ago, you can go to a party and there would be like the Red Cross or something like that, and you can have your ecstasy tested for, for dangerous substances. That's all gone, thanks, yeah. thanks to the Christian Democrats and the right-wing parties. So yeah, that sucks. <laughs> sucks ass. And, and well, this is another this is another big uh, advertisement to uh, uh, for all of you out there to go uh, get educated at either become a ganjier or at the Tricom Institute like I did, where you mm -hmm. can educate yourself how to use a microscope properly and then train your nose and you'll be able to do your own testing without having to worry about something like that. But I wanted to mention something because, you know, when I first came here, I did get a bud that had some testing along with it. And I'll even tell you where it was. It was at um, the Hague, maybe. It was at, it, uh, the. It was the in in um, in Utrecht. They have yeah. a, a a boat. Ah, um, yeah, yeah, the, yeah, the, the the culture boat. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, okay. And and I remember because when I got it and it came with a little card that came with it, and I remember dismissing it immediately because it said on the top it was uh, amnesia haze and it said one hundred percent sativa. <laughs> And I went, all right, fantastic. <laughs> well, that's something Phew, that you... <laughs> you're gone. Bye-bye. <laughs> Thank it's, you so much. It's, it's essentially some shops, you know, that are like a little bit like on the barricades or on the forefront of trying to, to uh, normalize and emancipate uh, cannabis a little bit more in the Netherlands. Yeah. They, you know, they, they, they basically say, okay, listen, when I buy it through the back door, I'm already doing something illegally then I might as well just take the next step and make sure that what I bought illegally is tested, although still illegally, right. but at least we have a little bit more information. And that's, that's, where, that's where you want to go towards to anyway, because the whole concept of doing this experiment is also to give more transparent information about content of a product that you're buying so that you can make 
a reliable choice and is this a product that I want or not? The same as if as when you're standing in the supermarket and you have right. to decide if this is the shampoo you want to wash your hair or if this is the shampoo you, you want to wash right. your hair, you know? So with the, with the experiment, They've, so they, I understand the premise. And so we've got 10 cities. We've got 10 different uh, uh, individual uh, farms uh, growing for, for farms are growing for this thing. Um, you, who are you growing for? You're which, are you allowed to say which? Uh, yeah, yes. I'm working, I'm working for the company Hollygram. Um, okay. This is a, a company which is located in the north of the Netherlands in the province of Groningen, uh, to be precise, in a small village called New Beerta, where we actually had a mayor that was more than welcoming our weed factory in his town because he saw opportunity when it comes to employment. And uh, yeah, and basically it, it helps to put his little community on the map in the Netherlands, of course. Um, and, the company, awesome. and, the, and the company Hologram is basically a kind of a joint venture between two groups. Um, on the one side, there is uh, uh, the main investor, which is uh, Jetsa, who is the owner of uh, uh, BioBiz Organic Plant Food. Mm -hmm. it's, it's in, in Europe, it's, it's nowadays, it's one of the biggest brands for organic uh, plant food for cannabis. Mm -hmm. And on the other side, there was a couple called John and Enos, and they had this uh, a foundation called Join Us. And what they did several years ago already, I think it's about a decade ago, they already started producing uh, cannabis legally. They went to police, they went to justice department, they went to the tax company, to the mayor, everybody saying, guys, we're opening up a farm in your village and we're going to grow weed legally so that the shops in this area can buy their weed with an invoice. They don't have to collect cash money. They can just go to the bank and make a transfer and stuff like that because this is the way we want to do it. This is the way it's supposed to be. And it's, it's because of groups like uh, uh, join us from John and Enos that just said, you know what, instead of doing things hush hush and through the back door, we're going to do it open in front, deal with it. And it's, and it's, because, and it's because of those actions that uh, national politics started talking about, uh, talking about uh, a, a new solution again, you know, and uh, a new compromise. Are we going to legalize it? Are we going to decriminalize it? And in the end, the result of that was the experiment. So, like, uh, like we, like we, like we love to do in Holland, we make compromises between everything. So, in, so, so, in essence, it's giving each one of these cities an opportunity to really make their own mark in in the industry, and and possibly even for cannabis tourism. Am I am uh, I seeing it that way? I mean, because yes. Yeah, it's, it's, if, it's, if you've got a, a mayor who's who's supporting you 100 percent and is willing to, you know, do whatever you oh, need well, to well, do. Well, 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 oh. Support oh. support is maybe maybe a little bit weird because essentially uh, the 10 cities where this experiment is going to take place are cities where the mayor said we are going to do this whether you like it or not. So coffee shops in my town, we are going to do the experiment if you don't like it no problem give us your uh, uh your permit you know your tolerated yeah. permit and fuck off so okay. so it's not really not an easy smooth and, and for <laughs> example you you mentioned the culture boat in utrecht at yeah. one point at one point the government said hey listen 10 cities maybe is not enough we want to have one extra city a, a bigger one you know because because the towns that are participating now are like um, they have a population somewhere between 200 and 300,000. And we want to have like a city like Rotterdam, Utrecht, The Hague, Amsterdam, like a bigger city to have a better monitoring of how the experiment is going to proceed. So Utrecht uh, was a candidate. Uh, the mayor of Utrecht, uh, Sharon Dijksma, who is a, like a socialist polit politica, she said, okay, I want to do this. And she started uh, a dialogue with the shops in town saying, hey guys and girls, do you want to participate in this experiment or not? And three shops, amongst them was the Culture Boat, Calerai uh, Colorado and Coffee Shop VIP. They said, yeah, bring it on. Because we want to have, we also want to know what we are buying. We want to know what quality it is, where it comes from and what's inside. And that way we can advise our clients much better in which bud to choose. But eight other coffee shops they said no fucking way because we we are relying so much on Moroccan hashies and if we are going to participate in this experiment 
we're not going to have Moroccan hashes anymore because everything needs to be produced in the Netherlands. You cannot... Now, all three, all three and, of those and... are some, th those are three of the most uh, the popular uh, places in town, right? Yeah. So yeah. that's quite an unselfish, unselfish position to take, to to say that it's, they were willing to. It's it's very simple, you know. The 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 uncertainty of unknown of an unknown future is what makes most people decide to just keep the things as they are. Especially in Utrecht, you have quite a lot of uh, dealing on the street, and a lot of it is Moroccan hashish, and they they already have competitive prices and crappy quality, so they're already competing with that. And they and the shops that didn't want to participate in the experiment, they said, what is going to happen is that people will not come to our store anymore to buy state-produced wheat. They will go on the street to buy the real stuff. So, and in the end, Utrecht did not participate because the mayor was progressive enough to say, okay, listen, if I don't have a majority of the shops behind me, I'm not going to do it. So we are still working with 10 cities and, and, and still we are in a situation that in every city, there are several shops that say, uh, you know what, I'd rather close my store for four years than, than sell this state controlled cannabis. But in okay, the so end, it, we're, not, we're not producing state. I, look, I, I don't look like a guy that works for the state, right? I just work, <laughs> I just work for a guy that has been producing organic fertilizer for, for cannabis his whole life. And I'm working for people that have been growing, trying to grow wheat legally to emancipate the plant and, and, and open the market for real. So that's the people I'm working for. It has nothing to do with state controlled weed or something like that. Okay, they are on our ass, of course, to make sure that we do everything by the book because, because of course, the government, the authorities are expecting that coffee shops and people that grow weed are, by definition, people that do shady business. So we will be looking for we will be looking for ways to maybe sell some weed under the table or 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 yeah. take some black money and stuff like that, which is of course nonsense because the only thing that we want is like so many other people all over the world grow weed legally right. and and buy the book. And what's going to happen if you're going to grow weed exactly as you supposed to? You know, uh, it's it, for for example, you know, when you talk about the quality of the weed, you know, some people said, okay, listen, because you have to sell the weed pre-packaged, you know, normally if you go to a coffee shop, they will have the weed there, you can look at it, smell it, and then they'll wait for you, and then you take it home. That's not okay. going to be the case anymore. We have to, if somebody orders a kilo, we have to pre-package that in one gram, two gram, five gram uh, uh, packaging and stuff like that. So people are going like, yeah, but shit, but then how do people know if it's a good quality? You know, when they open the bag, you know, and there's something crappy inside. I said, yeah, well, Damn. yeah, dude, listen, the only thing I can tell you is that when you open that bag and you take out that flower, it will be the first time in the whole life cycle of that plant that a human skin is touching the bud. Oh. What, what does that say for quality? Oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we were talking about that before and uh, it, it just popped in my head, but, but, you know, this is where we're going to towards, you know, this is, essentially what we need and what we want and and for this experiment you know let's just say when when the first plant came out and there was this ri ridiculous amount of rules and guidelines that you have to follow a lot of people were like okay it's going to be like like uh, state controlled medical cannabis which is gamma with ga is, uh, rayed with gamma rays and stuff like that it's, that's not something that we want you know uh, um I'm not familiar with the local medical quality of the local medical uh, cannabis quality. Is it? It's, it's it's more it's more focused on being exactly the same every batch than it is when it comes to like terpenes or flavors or, or stuff like that. Okay, that's that's, that's so no. Okay. So so now you're in charge. You got yourself. You got you got the you've got the spot. Now we can start creating our own stuff for our city. What are you creating? And and how do you go about picking what cultivars you're gonna to grow. Oh, that's, <laughs> <laughs> it's it's one of the nicest jobs, of course, and it's also one of the shittiest jobs because yeah. the first thing that you need to do essentially is uh, the, first of all, um, you know, the con our concept is that we're going to grow everything organically in the living soil. You know, this is this yeah. is uh, this our our heritage has always been growing organically, so that that's the the the, the method we know best. So that's what we're going to do. 
Um, okay. So I think we already have, we're already going to make a huge step uh, compared to the quality that is available in coffee shops right now, because the vast majority of all the weed in the Netherlands is grown with mineral fertilizers, commercially badly flushed, uh, harvested too early. Uh, so, so no, we need to get away from that. But yeah. then essentially, if you say, okay, uh, there is the, for for example we have we have some of the ten farms. Uh, one is uh, cookies uh, from America, cookies Netherlands. Uh, um, uh, there are some other, uh, I think two or three other companies that have uh, majority stakeholders from Aurora and from Village Farms, and there's several uh, Canadian American companies that have already basically found their position within the experiment. And of course they will say, okay. What we're going to offer you is all the super Kali stuff and the Canadian stuff that we're growing right now. And, and that sounds, of course, for a, a part of the people that go into coffee shops, that sounds super interesting. But in the end, uh, what I did uh, is just simply go to a shop and say, okay, listen, what do you want? What are you expecting? You know, uh, what are your wishes? And then you will find out that it, depending on the shop and depending also on which town they are, they have completely different uh, preferences uh, on how they want to proceed. Some say, Patrick, can you please, please get me like this good old Northern Light number five that we had like 20 years ago. I haven't seen it around. I don't even know what real white widow looks or tastes like anymore, you know? So uh, top 44, which is like uh, somewhere end of the nineties, is that still around? Can you get something <laughs> like this? While other people are saying, hey, listen, I want this cookie, creamy, cakey uh, stuff, uh, uh, you know, uh, from the US, but is it, does it really have to be that expensive? And I'm like, dude, listen, you know, whether you, uh, if you grow a Girl Scout cookie or a White Widow in the Netherlands, they both take about nine weeks of flowering. So why is it going to be that much more expensive? It's not really necessary. So you're focusing more on on okay, what people what people want, uh, um, uh, what they are hoping for, instead of saying this is what we have, deal with it, you know, because because uh, we are everybody is still building the farm, uh, um, we we are still uh, uh, we have to make changes because electricity has become so much more expensive. We have to put solar panels on top. So how dramatic, yeah. let, let's stop that. How dramatic is that? Because I've been hearing electricity, electricity, electricity since I, since I got back here. Is it, is it crazy? What has happened? Uh, well, it's very simple. You can imagine that you have like for, uh, you have a budget for one year of, of growing wheat under LED lights with HVAC and everything of, uh, let's say 1 million. Yeah. That was when, when, you, when we made the plans in, 2019, 2018, you know, it was approximately 1 million. That's now somewhere between 4 and 5 million. Oh, okay. By next year, it can maybe even be 6. We don't know. So that's, that's an interesting point as well, because uh, you don't want to get into a situation like, like what happened in America. You legalize cannabis, and cannabis suddenly becomes... I don't know how much more expensive for the simple fact that now it's a legal product. So you're going to put taxes on it. You're going to put this on it. You're going to put that on it, blah, 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 blah. And suddenly you're paying what, $20 for a gram or something? So Let me ask you, you know, one of the things that concerned me originally when I heard about the, the, the experiment was that you could end up falling into a same trap of, of kind of what was happening in Canada. And, you know, yeah. and recently in Canada, they've, had, they've got so much surplus of everything, right? And I, well, I forgot how, what the number of how many grams that they ended up destroying last year because they would just they they had set the rules. This is what the quality has to be. This yeah. is at this level. This is too old. You have to destroy the product. And which is another thing that's really stupid to me. Why are you destroying the product? And why are not we're not taking it all the way to distill it? Right? Why why are you not why are you not making it into hashish, for example? Well, exactly. Or there's so many other things we could be doing other than just destroying it. Um, exactly. is, has there been any kind of discussion about this? In, yeah, in yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's because you, you cannot have a situation, you know, when we start this experiment, which is going to be probably the end of next year, um, you cannot have a situation where a coffee shop 
orders some wheat from one of the 10 farms and it's out of stock. It's not available anymore. You know, that now we have, when the experiment will start, the shops will have six weeks time to sell the wheat that they bought through the back door in the black market alongside the legally produced cannabis. You know, and after those six weeks, they, 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 their old stock needs to be gone and they're only focusing on what is legally produced in those 10 farms. If for some reason, all the 10 farms get botrytis or massive mildew and we don't have anything to uh, supply anymore, then we're in deep shit because then 70% yeah. of the coffee shops don't have wheat anymore. So that, that's something that cannot happen. So they said, when you make this farm, you need to be able to produce at least six and a half tons per year. That's six and a half thousand kilos. That's, that's what, 13,000 pounds or something like 14,000 yeah. pounds. Um, now, there is uh, 74 shops. There is so a total of uh, 65,000 kilos that uh, farms need to be able to produce. And that is approximately two and a half to three times more than the shops in those cities are selling now. So... So they, we already have a, a kind of an overproduction calculated into the whole plan to make sure that there will never be a situation where something is out of stock. Now, if you get, it's very simple. If, if there is a shop that doesn't sell more than a kilo per day, you know, that's 365 kilos a year. Uh, um, yeah, that's, that's not, uh, there is more than enough weed uh, and hashes to choose from. But mm -hmm. there is going, basically it's very simple. Uh, the demand is, is here and uh, the, the, uh, the supply is here. So right. prices will naturally go down because of that. And of course, there will are you be- gonna, uh, are, are you gonna be allowed to be creative as far as what you do with it? What kind of products and things you're gonna be able to create? Sure, sure. Okay. Listen, I, you can imagine, you have a situation, for example, where a shop says, okay, listen, uh, I want to buy Amnesia from you, uh, which is like all common in every, every uh, coffee shop, but I don't want to have the same Amnesia as the shop next door. You know, I want to have something so I'd be able to define myself from others. So you, you need to have uh, a variation of phenos from Amnesia, for example, so that you have a little bit of different flavor, but you can also say, okay, we're going to do this batch, of amnesia, we're going to do a uh, wet trim. We're going to do one as a dry trim. We're going to do some uh, uh, dry freezing because that will give you a different quality. That will give you a different flavor. So uh, with hashish, the same thing. We can, you know, we can uh, make hashish from what is left over from wet trim and dry trim. But we can also say, hey, you know what? Let's make hashish from real flour. So you know, that's that's a different quality. That's that's a different consistency. So uh, in, in such a way, we can be as creative as we want. The only thing right. that we are not allowed to do is we cannot make extractions. So okay. we cannot make uh, a BHO dabs and stuff like that. That's something we cannot do. Basically, what we, what we are allowed to produce is wheat, so flour, hashish, pre-rolled joints, and edibles. And those edibles are not, we cannot make them with extractions. So we basically, we make them by putting some hashes inside or some sharas or some roisin. And, and we're still trying to figure out, or for example, a wheat butter, if that is considered an extraction method or not. Mm -hmm. no, because, you're, because you're basically, you're using a foreign substance to extract uh, a, a, a psychotropic material from a plant, which is, right. it's a little bit the gray zone. But if you want to make quality uh, uh, edibles, and you, you, you cannot, for example, make wheat butter to make a decent cake, and you just have to grind some weed or some ashes in there, it's going to be a little bit different. Huh? So yeah. there, is, there is a limit to the creativity that we're allowed to, to use. Mm -hmm. So we, it seems like you have really great opportunity. Yeah. Having the yeah. ability <laughs> to do the testing, to be able to know the specificity and the cleanliness of the product, gives you then a product which you can then be very confident in making concentrates or making edibles and or making moon rocks and or distillates of any type. Is there a, we were just at the, the squash off 
uh, uh, at the end of the Jack haircut. Yeah. Uh, there's there's a loophole that's kind of flowing out there right now where rosin, where you're not adding anything to it, just pressing, pressing the buds, seems to be something that is uh, coffee shops are starting to incorporate more and more into. I'm seeing more presses starting to show up in the shop. Do no. you see that as being something that you guys will be able to to ride with, or are you going to have to wait that out and see? If that's going to, um, why is that? <laughs> I asked the right question. I that's, had to that's, think about that's it. A that's good. good. <laughs> the, the rosin part, you know, um, it is not really on our radar at the moment. We are more focusing on the fact uh, that uh, uh, hashish is no longer coming from Morocco, and, and and some people are saying, "Hey, but we want to have Moroccan hash, or we want to have hash that at least tastes." And has this uh, like Moroccan hash and has the same effect. So we're more focused at this moment on you know okay we will have a certain amount of flour at one point and we will need to reserve as much plant material and flour of making sufficient amounts of hashish. Now if you're going to say okay we want to have sufficient amount of hashish but we also want to have uh, uh, um, um, some roisin on the side, uh, you know, it might it might uh, put too much pressure on the supply of normal flour to the shops. We don't know yet because, of course, it's an experiment. We we don't know what is going to happen when we start selling our products. You know, right. this is this is something that will come maybe in a later stage uh, of the experiment when we're in, let's say, for example, a year, a year and a half, because then we will have a much better view of the flow of, of uh, which specific genetics of weed, which hashes, how many pre-roll joints are we selling? And then maybe you are able to reserve extra time to go more into in depth into, for example, Roizen. But at the same time, if you have, let's say, uh, dry sieve, if you have uh, isolator, if you have uh, um, uh, normally pressed hashes, if you have specialized, uh, you know, you can with, with when it comes to hash, you already have such a huge amount of possibilities to, to produce different styles, different flavors, different effects, that uh, uh, Roizen is, is, is not that much on our radar, radar at the yeah. moment. And I have, I have to admit that this is also not something that you see very often in the shops that are participating in the experiment. So when it comes no. to like variations in hashes, yes. But, mm -hmm. but essentially, a, a shop is also not to, to not allowed to sell extraction because that is uh, still on the number one list of opioids uh, as being uh, considered a hard drug. Right. Crazy so. talk. Um, <laughs> so to, let's, uh, let, let's talk about pricing. So, so what kind yeah. of prices are, are your customers going to see as opposed to somebody coming into Amsterdam? What kind of a variety? So we're gonna let's. How many different options should I expect to see if uh, when I when I come into your city, into one of those uh, shops? The prices need to be lower. The prices need okay. to be lower than what they at, are at this moment, or at least they should be the same. I, I have to admit, Amsterdam is like is like a really bad example because uh, I was uh, um, in Amsterdam with a mutual friend of ours, uh, Herbert M. Green, the entrepreneur. Yes. Uh, yeah, uh, he sends his best regards, by the way. I talked to him yesterday. <laughs> we, went, we, went, we went into some, some like of the, the most known coffee shops in Amsterdam. Uh, and I saw, I saw weed there that was the same quality as what I can get in my own town. But in my own town, I pay uh, 10 euros for it. And over there, I'm paying 17 to 18 euros for it. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, when you ask the bud tender, okay, can you give me a flower which has been grown on soil, which has been properly flushed, or which has been cured for uh, several weeks? What do you have? They don't know. They don't know because they don't know where it's coming from. They're just putting top price on. And essentially, if you want an experiment to work, you, you, you're going to buy weed from a source that you don't know yet, which is an official source. Are these people genuine or are they just in the, in the game for making money? Then it's being presented in a packaging, which is a neutral packaging with warnings on it. Okay, uh, don't smoke if you're pregnant, keep out of reach of children. So it looks different from what you're buying now. It looks more official. It looks more distant. So if you then have to pay more for such a flower than you're paying now, 
and you go like, you know what? I, I know a guy that is selling some weed out of his house. I'll just go there and I'll just buy something for like seven, eight euros a gram. I don't know what it is exactly, but at least I'm smoking some weed. Yeah. So if you want to determine the work, you need to be, you need to be sure that the people in that town will be stimulated, motivated to go into a shop and buy that legally produced stuff. Now you can do that by by, by uh, having traceable quality and having exact information of what you're buying, that you know exactly which turbine profiles it has, so you know also what to expect from the effect. But if that is going to be more expensive, then the experiment is not going to work. If you make it a little bit cheaper, which is a very uh, realistic possibility for the simple fact that we have overproduction and therefore prices of also also prices will go down that should have a positive effect in the stores as well where the weed will not only be from traceable origin but will also be cheaper so i'm, I'm aiming because of course i cannot say to a shop listen i'm selling you this product for this price now you will have to sell it for this price that's not something i can do it's we are on a free market if i sell some something for, to somebody for five euros a gram and he wants to sell for 15 there's nothing i can do about it but the shops do realize that they have a, a fantastic opportunity to attract more customers to their, to their store by having more information right. by having better quality and by having a better price and uh, for example in towns like maastricht where tourists are not allowed to buy anything they say listen bring it on we used to be we used to be the amsterdam of the south and we want to be the Amsterdam of the South again. We want the people from the whole province uh, of Limburg, where Maastricht is located, we want them to come to Maastricht to make a fantastic day out. Maastricht is a beautiful town. Uh, it's one of my favorite towns that, that I'm visiting for my work as well. Uh, we want to go to a beautiful town. We want, we want to buy some top quality wheat and we want, it, we want it to be like a nice price. Because in Maastricht, on the corner of each coffee shop, there will be a few dudes selling on the street as well because they are they are trying to catch the tourists that still don't know that in maastricht you cannot buy weed in a coffee shop if you're if you're not from the netherlands you know we want to basically we want to give we don't want to give those people a chance to to put the foot in the door you know because, because we have better quality and because we have better prices it's uh, what i'm ex ex expecting is that you're going to be going to going to towards like a, a level where we are paying prices uh, like at social clubs in Spain. So somewhere between, let's say, I'm, I'm making a bold statement now, uh, between six and a half and seven and a half euros, you have like a decent standard quality of bud. And so somewhere between nine, 10, 11, you have something exceptional. Okay. Maybe, maybe if you get something for 15, it will be like a, like an original pure blend haze that has been flowering for 16 weeks or something like that. Okay, so there I would you just led me right into the next level, which was <laughs> curing. And and you know, that's one of the things that I've learned in, in some of the travels that I've been doing recently, especially around through Spain, is that one of the advantages that Spain has uh, uh, grasped from the Netherlands is curing. And uh, I, I think I even mentioned to you when I saw you at the cup here that uh, one of the, the, the clubs that I went down to in Huelva, Spain, even has listings on the menu. So you'll have like a, an amnesia haze and it'll say, you know, limonene, um, uh, uh, a Linanol, perfect wake up, and, and a little, right? And then it'll say cured 18 weeks. Oh. Then the next one underneath that is, uh, you know, uh, 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 forbidden fruit, uh, da, 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 cured 22 weeks, cured six, I, every single one of the cultivars on both sides, on all, on all sides of the menu had curing times on them. Some of them were very small, four weeks. Uh, some of them were incredibly long, the 32 weeks I saw on one of them. When I asked one of the, and, and again, this is Spain, so this is an association, so they're growing for their membership, right? This was a specific request of the membership. It is something that they've, they've advanced. I found it at other clubs while I was down there, and I have to tell you, it was spectacular. And I was, when I asked the guy how it was, became of this, they always mentioned Amsterdam. 
And they say, when you go to Amsterdam, where we most of us started and got our first buds yeah, and did yeah, all yeah, this, yeah, yeah. that is like the McDonald's of cannabis. It's grown, <laughs> it's pulled up, it's put on the bun, and it's put out the door. Much and everything now. Fast, fast, fast. Yeah, yeah. Exactly, right? So does this give you an opportunity? And do you have the capability? Uh, and is that in part of your yes. makeup in yes. doing this experiment of having? Absolutely. Suspicion? Okay. As, as I said, you, you want to have uh, uh, situations where you can offer a shop something that is unique. You know, so some shops will say, for example, stores where, um, let's, let's take, for example, Nijmegen. You know, Nijmegen has a lot of German people coming over from the border buying weed. They are selling exponentially more every day than a, than a, a, a shop in a town where, where only locals are allowed. Right. Yeah. So they, for them, it's more about uh, 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 price quality. You know, it needs to be, everything needs to be a little bit faster because they have a higher demand. Yeah. So, so for them, they will go for something. They, they don't need 24 weeks of curing. They will need, they will need uh, a good smelling, good tasting, effective flower, a little bit faster. But right. for example, for Maastricht and Breda, where they can only have locals, yeah, for sure, their additional value to make sure that the locals will continue to buy from them and the locals from the town next door will also come to them. That's when you want to have those extra sales arguments. But you have yeah. to, that, that, then, then maybe I have a question for you as well, as, as uh, uh, the cannabis connoisseur I got to know you uh, like, mm -hmm. is, is the 24 weeks of curing, is that for you, does it give you an extra emotional value or does it give you an extra realistic value if you would if you would smoke the same flower that has not been cured for 24 weeks okay so i can tell you uh, yes. that when i i tasted these all back to back to back right after i had left the netherlands after finishing both the jack hair cup and the dutch flowers cup and i had went from there directly down to portugal and then portugal down to huelva spain and I hit three clubs. All of them had the similar type of a thing. Only one of them out of those three was promoting it. So uh, your first uh, 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 question is absolutely correct. Emotionally, I was thrilled with it. And that was gave me probably as much of a buzz as anything else right off the bat, just looking at it and going, wow, they are taking the curing and turning it into a marketing tool. This is awesome. So yes, there was definitely that type of a buzz. But then I very, I very much did sit down and and try specific and conscien conscientiously thinking about this has been cured for thirty six weeks. Is this is this too mild for me now? And in some cases, I found the longer it was cured, the more the uh, I lost some of the character. I think, or more, or some of the, the that I, I would look for with a particular, it seemed to become more of a, 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 a generalization of whatever that cultivar was, rather than something that might have been uh, particularly sharp or strong or uh, wow. with a very strong uh, 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 aroma profile. Uh, other questions. Now, in your, in your experiment, in your fields, in your, uh, your, your grow, are you only growing outdoors? Are you growing indoors? Are you growing hydroponically? Only, only indoors. Um, we have the possibility because we're we're like we're like in the pampas of of growing, and so we have huge fields around us. So we do have the possibility to to expand with uh, greenhouses in a later stage if we want. For the moment, we're just going to focus on indoor growing with LED light and with living soil. And we go as far as that we will have, have on the first, on the ground floor, we will have smaller uh, growing units. So we're not going to do these massive halls or stuff like that. We're going to make smaller batches, smaller cultivars, you know, because we want to, uh, we also believe in, you know, it's not only giving the plants an organic environment. We also believe in personal care. You know, if, if, yes. you, if you plant your plants and you, then you don't, spend any time in that room for the next four to eight weeks, 
uh, I think the plants will develop in a different way than if they get spe uh, special attention. For example, you will say, okay, this, today we're going to go in this room uh, because we need some lollipopping over here because the undergrowth is, is, not, uh, is, is, is blocking the plant from, from further development. So you're taking personal time with each cultivar. You know, that, that's, that's something you want to work on. On the top floor, on the, on the first floor, we, uh, on, the, on the down floor, we have smaller growing units where we grow in uh, two, state, uh, two floors. Mm -hmm. On the top one, we'll have the lights hanging up much higher and we grow much bigger plants. We, we will allow them to stretch out in a natural way because uh, those plants we're going to use more, for example, for hash production and stuff like that. Um, in a later stage, if we also can have some greenhouses, that will be completely focused on, on uh, uh, hash production, edibles, uh, maybe pre-roll joints. You know, you can even you can even go as far as that you will say, in winter you will have winter weed, in the summer you will have summer weed. You know, depending on the season, you can plant specific flavors, specific genetics. You know, to give like a, an extra support to the season that you're in. But mm -hmm. but in general, hydroponics, no 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 no, no, no. that's not. You, we that we might consider, but it, this depends completely on the demand that you have. You know that maybe in, we will have situations where we will need more flower production or a different quality of flower production for the for making some ashes. Then it might be that we'll just maybe go for like cocoa slabs or something like that. Something that is a little bit more um, that goes more towards the speed and uh, weight than it goes for general quality because in the end you're going to you're going to make something different out of it anyway. But, but essentially, when it comes to flour, you know, when it comes to top quality flour that you want to sell in, in the store, everything will be completely organic. I, I think so. I think that that is the logical way to go anyway. Uh, yeah. To be really honest, it's, I mean, I mean, there there has been there have been sufficient tests in the past, and especially people that are listening in America, they in California and Washington State and Colorado, they probably know that there has been a huge discussion in the past about the fact that organic fertilizers have a higher heavy metal content uh, than mineral fertilizers. So the debate was, okay, it's better to use mineral fertilizers because there will be less heavy metals left over in the final product than if you're using organic uh, products. But in fact, the concentration of heavy metals in organic plant food is higher because it's organic plant material. But the heavy metals that are inside are naturally occurring heavy metals that are easily compatible with the plant and are easily assimilated by the plant through natural process. So this is the way that you want to work with everything. In the end, when they did a test with mineral grown uh, buds and with organically grown buds, the heavy metal content in the mineral grown buds was higher than in the organically grown buds for the simple fact that it was foreign material in the form of a salt or whatever being introduced and the plant is not able to assimil assimilate it in the same natural method as it would do with organics. So, so for us, when we want to produce a quality bud and we want to have it uh, uh, for sure as little as possible in heavy metals inside, then organically grown is the way to proceed anyway. Sure. You know, Absolutely. It, needs, it needs to be, it needs to be clean. It needs to be natural. And, and also to, to come back also to the curing part. Um, if you grow something organically on, on the soil or whatever, I think most people will confirm that it has this specific quality and specific flavor to it. Mm -hmm. And if you then, for example, if, if my, my, my preferred method of, of uh, uh, harvesting is, you know, I harvest my plants in the dark. You know, I use this little green LED light, so I see what I'm doing. I harvest in the dark, I just cut the plant, I hang it upside down, I'll make sure it has a temperature of about 15 to 16 degrees Celsius, which is somewhere around 30 Fahrenheit, 32 Fahrenheit in, 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 in America, I think, and the humidity of about 60%. Then I let it dry for about two weeks. Then I'll just put it in a jar. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll clean it, I'll put it in a jar, and I'll burp it for like one or two weeks, and that's it. And then I already have, like, if I open the pot, uh, my, my neighbor across the street is already smelling that I just have. It. So, <laughs> so it's, it's, I think also when you're growing organically, you do already have a head start when it comes to the, the, 
the final quality of the product. Mm -hmm. But I have to say, I am completely prejudiced huh, because I've been I've been uh, growing organically all my life. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> so what what is, is your prediction? What is your prediction right now? If you if you were looking in your in your crystal ball, how long is it before everything's supposed to kick off and and people can start buying product and and everything should be up and running? End of twenty three. I think end of 23. Uh, yeah, it has to be because there will be uh, several farms will be ready by. Well, actually, that's quite interesting. We were supposed to start the experiment last summer. Last that summer. Was, that was the plan. <laughs> yeah. Oops. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> but there has been Mr. delay upon. There has been a lot of bureaucratic hurdles that we had to go through. So, so we, we we just started building. The foundation is there. We're putting the sewer system in right now. And then we still have to put everything on top, you know, so. You mentioned I'm, the bureaucratic part. You mentioned the bureaucratic part. Now, this is a crucial part of this. You know, ultimately, this is only going to be as smooth as whoever's up on the top and whoever's making the final decisions about what's approved and what's not approved, right? Are the people that you've seen that are up on the very top that are making the decisions, are they educated? Are they, do they know enough about weed? Um, do they no. have enough? No, do, no, no, no. No, no, no. Yeah. There is the, let's just say that the, the um, what do you call them, Amtenaar, um, you know, the, the, the clergy, the, the, yes. pe the people that Church. work for the government, the people that work on the offices of the government that are responsible for, for uh, coordinating this experiment, uh, they, they are very open-minded in what we have to say about things. They, they do, we have, there is a lot of dialogue with them to see how we're how we're going on. For example, it's it's extremely difficult to get a bank account if you are a cannabis farm, even though we have a paper with the signature of the Ministry of Health and the Ministry of Justice that we are uh, a legal cannabis farm. Banks are still saying, "Okay, listen, if it has if it's something with weed, we don't want to touch it." So how can you how can you start building? A farm if you don't even have a bank account if you have no insurance if you have no way of paying your employees and stuff like that so that is a huge thing and then the government says or the, the responsible ministers or in parliament they're saying hey listen the banks need to give those people a bank account come on what the fuck is this and the bank says yeah okay that's okay if you give me a get out of jail free card and uh, then yeah. then i'll do it and so there is a little bit of a cat and mouse game because it's it's very simple the, I, I said this in another podcast. It's like basically going on a Tinder date, you know. Uh, and on one on one side of the table is is the government, and on the other side of the table is cannabis uh, uh, is coffee shops and and cannabis farms. And we we don't really know each other, so we're we're trying to figure out from each other if we can actually trust each other, you know. And the government says, "Listen, uh, I don't know you, so uh, for sure I want to do it with a condom." You know, I want to do it safe. I want to be absolutely sure that I'm not going to get sick from working or doing uh, going into a relationship with you. And we are like, hey, listen, we have been, we are going on Tinder dates since 40 years already. We know exactly what we're doing. Just trust us. Yeah. And and that that takes time. There is, however, uh, we have we work through uh, according to specific rules. Well, when the experiment starts and we find out that specific rules that have been put in place are practically impossible to, to uphold, then there are possibilities to adjust the system in such a way that we can continue in a more realistic and, and uh, progressive manner. So there is, there is flexibility here and there. But nevertheless, even in all those offices, you know, for example, uh, when you want to uh, when you want to get the final permission, you have to go through a financial screening, which is called BIBOF in the Netherlands. And basically, what they're doing is they're looking at all the investment money and where does it come from and from who does it come? Has this person been in contact with justice for whatever reason in the last five years? Is the mon money from traceable uh, uh, origin? Is it not so is it not money from the black market or something like that? And this financial screening, the government or the parliament said, okay, we're going to give top priority to those 10 farms so that they will pass this financial screening as quickly as possible because they need to start building. Right. Uh, uh, they said this in April, 2020. And uh, uh, three months ago, the last farm finally got his, uh, his approval. We, it, it took us one year. We waited for 
over one, no, sorry, over one year, I think one year and one and a half months before they gave us uh, a degree light so that we can finally start building. So we've lost a year simply because of that financial screen. And there is, of course, evil uh, whispers in the dark that say there is people working at that department that are uh, linked to the Christian Democrat parties, and they do everything in their power to slow down the process as much as possible. Now, if this is true, I don't know. Actually, I don't give a flying fuck because it's very simple. When the snowball starts rolling down the hill, you're not going to stop it anymore. Huh? You know, we're yeah. rolling. We're rolling and we're it's getting bigger and bigger. It's such a shame. Dude, you're so, I don't, it's I don't, such a shame. It kills me. It, it has, kills me. It has always been like that, you know? It's, I it's, don't. It's, it's essentially, if you, if you say now, you know what? Okay, they're making our life too difficult. You know what? Fuck it. Let's, we drop out. Forget about the experiment. Then we're basically giving a big middle finger to all the coffee shops that had to deal with that kind of shit uh, for the last 40 years, you know? Threats, what do you arrests, think? What do you, what do you think uh, will happen when Germany legalizes? <laughs> German, Germany did a few things immediately very, very well. Mm -hmm. What the difference, of course, is between Germany and the Netherlands is that in Germany, the political parties put in their election program, we want to legalize cannabis, and they got elected for it. That was not the case in the Netherlands at all. There were some parties that say, we would like to legalize, and there were some parties that say, no fucking way, and they made a compromise. In, in Germany, basically, the political parties have been elected with legalization in mind. So they are putting a little bit more effort in it than they did in the Netherlands. For example, you... what, they, what they did is they did a forum with like 200, uh, um, uh, 200 people that have knowledge about cannabis in a recreative way, in a medicinal way, uh, in a criminal way, in a scientific way. They put all these people together and they said, okay, figure out how you want to do it. And the system that Germany is going to uh, choose, probably, if my sources are correct, of course, uh, I lived in Germany a couple of years, so I do have uh, some sources there, but the system that they're going to use is that uh, uh, um, a dispensary, uh, if you get a license for a dispensary, that dispensary produces its own weed in Germany. So it's not going to be that, you know, all the American and Canadian companies are going like, ah, all right, everything that we have too much, we now just simply dump it in Germany because Germany's going like, hey, wait a minute, wait a minute. They, they have very, very strict rules in how they produce their beer. You know, it's called the Reinheitsgebot. You know, it's, it needs to be completely pure and only with these authorized ingredients. They're going to have the same, you, you can imagine the same atmosphere is going to be around the production of cannabis as well. So yeah. a dispensary produces its own cannabis. That way, the only two uh, um, entities that are, uh, um, that are can, can take the situation into an advantage is a dispensary and the government. There is going to be no middleman. There is not going to be some cannabis entrepreneurs with uh, some some basketball players from America that come with a big bag of money and say, okay, listen, I'm going to take over the German market. That's they're going to it's going to be very inclusive. It's going to be a German thing for German people alone. So I don't expect that they are going to allow tourism in Germany as well. Okay, maybe Berlin will have an exception. But that is already a very clever method of, of organizing legalization because what you want to avoid, and I think you've seen it in Canada and America as well, is that basically big money just takes over. They don't give a flying fuck about the weed. They're just, give, they're just interested in return investment. And, that's, and, and an experiment in the Netherlands is not going to work, or a legalization in, in Germany is not going to work if it's only going to be about the money and not about the substance that people have to buy. Exactly. That's, that's exactly. the whole thing. It's, it's, and it's a real shame. Uh, I, I was like years ago or something, I was in, in Chile and I was at Mondo TV, which is like a cannabis orientated uh, channel. And they did an interview with me there live on TV. And I was like, guys, listen, I don't want to talk too much about uh, cannabis because it's still very illegal here. It, it, it's still very illegal in lots of parts in Europe. I don't want to expose my family and my friends too much, you know, for being in the cannabis industry. And the first question the guy asked when we went live is, what do you think about legalization? I went, God damn it. And I said to him also, I said, listen, <laughs> legalization, why are we talking about 
legalization. There, it, you know, somebody has decided at one point in the past that this specific plant is illegal. Uh, and, but before we had all over the world, if you go to Bologna and Italy, you will see cannabis leaves on all buildings and it will say underneath cannabis protects us. We had a huge hemp industry. We had a huge medicinal cannabis industry as well, you know, at the end of the 18th and uh, 19th century, beginning of the 20th. And then somebody decided, who was it? This, this FBI guy in, uh, in America decided, okay, the ban on alcohol is gone. So we need to find a new puppy to play with. Okay, let's make uh, cannabis, uh, no, sorry, marijuana illegal. But in fact, I, I, what, what, you can, what you can also do is, is very simple, say, okay, we are going to decriminalize cannabis. That means we'll just take it off the list of forbidden substances. That means everybody can do with a plant whatever the fuck they like. And if yeah, you it are should big, be like growing tomatoes. If you're a big money corporation, you want to make huge money with the sales of cannabis, but everybody that is your potential customer has their garden and their balcony and their attic full of weed, they're not going to make big money on it. And that's how you take the wind out of the sales of big money corporations and give the plant back to the people. That, that would be the most optimal situation. You know, if, for example, if you decriminalize, then the whole uh, issue of home growing would also immediately be solved. Because do you think do you think if Germany decriminalized just went that way and just said we're gonna do a full just straight decriminalization, would it what kind of effect would it have here in the Netherlands? If you do decriminalization in the Netherlands, then all then all coffee shops will have their own uh, cultivars with people that they trust, and they will sell the wheat that is completely. They will hand pick the genetics by themselves. They will have growers that they've been working with for the last 20, 30, 40 years. They will have a trusted product. But the only difference will be that there is no obligation in having the product tested for heavy metals, mold, and stuff like that. And, right. and when it comes to uh, national health and education and prevention, because you know it's not like if, if, you, if you legalize or decriminalize cannabis, it doesn't mean that we want everybody to start smoking weed because mm -hmm. it's not necessarily good for your health. You know, you see me smoking my, 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 my joints. I mean, I'm already on the third one and it's only 11.30 in the morning. I don't want my kids to grow up in the same way. It's not necessary for my kids to grow up. In the Do same you smoke way. pure but, but, or but with before, tobacco? I smoke with tobacco. But honestly, if you decriminalize it, and this is something that has been proven to be effective in the Netherlands, if you decriminalize it, okay, in our case, it's toleration. We tolerate the consumption and possession of cannabis. We have the lowest percentage of cannabis viewers in Europe. As you go, if you go to Germany and to France, where it is extremely forbidden, I've, I've lost my license already three times uh, traveling through Europe with cannabis. France has like 50% of people smoking cannabis. Mm. So it's very simple. If you, if you take something out of the illegal atmosphere, it immediately, it immediately becomes less interesting for people to use. Look, sure. look, at, look at, at the alcohol ban in America. It's a good example. Sure. Well, and also, if you look at all of the states where they legalized cannabis, the use of cannabis has went down. And, no, go and, and government revenue went up. <laughs> When, when, when the, going back to, to the, the experiment, are you going to be allowed to experiment within your experiment to do things and create uh, ex exterior types of products? Uh, 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 Suver Nuver, you know, has uh, the, the water that they're producing now. No. Uh, will you be able to produce no. any any RSO like a Rick Simpson oil for people that have uh, that really need it for a, a medicine, like hardcore? No. No. You know, no, no. no. What because about it's... what about different types of distribution like the vaporizers or the patches or the the no. the uh, the no. the no. salves? No, only what we are basically, what we are allowed to do is we are allowed to create, to produce recreational substances for 74 shops in 10 towns. That's it. We cannot sell anything else anywhere else. Mm -hmm. because, because then also, how can you monitor the success of an experiment if you're selling at the same time everywhere else a different type of product? And, and mm -hmm. honestly, um, we, don't, we don't have that expertise yet. Uh, yeah. We are not, we are not, you know, we are basically in general, we are weed growers and we are finally have the possibility of doing that legally. 
you know. Uh, um, uh, when it comes to oil and stuff like that, you know, there is like Suvel Nuvo, they have much more expertise in this. Why do we want to take that away from them or copy that from them as well? What, what I want is that basically everybody in the Netherlands is able to grow their own weed as well and make their own oil out of it. Uh, and then be, be advised by Suvel Nuvo, to be advised by Werner Browning in, yeah, in how exactly. they can do such a thing. The thing is, you know, if we're going to, if we will be able to, uh, get to the finish line with this experiment and we're finally going to take cannabis off the list of illegal substances then basically it is a free plan for everybody to use as they see fit and then I'm sure there will be a lot of people that say okay now fine because I've been making patches uh, the last 10 years but secretly in my home now I can make my job out of it yeah. all right bring it on you know we need we need emancipation and uh, normalization of the cannabis plant and then let the people decide for themselves how they want to uh, proceed with it. I think that that works best and not, not by saying, okay, now it's legal. We're going to give out tenders to investment companies and they will jump on it. You know, that's, mm -hmm. it's, we've, we've already done that with everything. Oh, you know? right. so yeah, no. <laughs> As it, you know, um, one of the, one of the challenges that I've, I've been having with, uh, you, you know, my personal thing about trying to have as few people touching the buds as possible yeah. from the time. My favorite place is up in Canada is a spot. And, and when you walk through the door, it says your buds have only been touched twice. Once when it was harvested oh. and once when it was put into the, 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 into the bag. I love and, that kind of stuff. And, and you, right? So in the United States now and in Canada, and a lot of these places, when you go to purchase your cannabis now, the buyer never even gets a chance to pick a bud or say, I want that or this. It's already prepackaged yeah. inside yeah. something because it has to be it's being tested and done. Have you guys thought about that element? Because it has been one of my challenges. It's the, the, the thing I love the most about going back and, and getting buds that I know that haven't been but I hate the fact that I can't pick out a nice seven, just, well, five yeah. gram, a five gram bud uh, uh, from, from, you know, that's, <laughs> that's one of the great advantages that we have here. And in, and down in Spain is being able to pick out your own, your one beautiful, you know, your, your Cinderella. Uh, it's, it's, it's basically, we, you know, it's prepackaged because they want to eliminate every possible risk of hygiene contamination and of uh, bending the rules. You know, right. if, 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 because in the beginning when they said, okay, pa uh, Pat, do you want to come work for us for the experiment? I was like, yeah, sure. You know, mm -hmm. it's going to be very simple. That shop orders a kilo. I'll just pack one kilo and just ship it over. You know, <laughs> easy peasy, lemon squeezy. Yeah. But no, 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 yeah. no, no. It has to be packaged and everything because yeah. uh, if, if it's not packaged, then how do I know that it's that specific flower that I'm- right. but can, can there be a window in it or something in it yeah, so that yes, it can yes, be, yes, 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 yes. And, you know, and, and, if every, we have time to design, every, just so that I can see that there's yes, a good size yeah, bud in there. Of no. course, you can see it. You can see it. Yeah. It's not It's not going to be those completely closed foil packaging with nice coloring that you have when you buy some Kali weed in the shop for too much money. That's not going to happen because we can't right. make it, we can't make it colorful and sexy. Sure. You know, yeah, you know, uh, you don't uh, have uh, uh, again all of that is just extra cover and it's a, that that it's covering up the buds so that I can't see what I'm buying. It's, uh, it's all of piece, those you can have a transparent package and at the same time every shop has like an exemption for 150 grams of flower material every month that they can put so on can display see. for show and smell. Yes, yeah, yes. Sure. Which, which yeah. is, of course, it, it's, 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 it's still a little bit on the low side because if you're just going to put a bud on display for, let's say, a month, it's not going to smell the same oh, anymore no. after a month. Yeah. You know? and, you would, if you're, oh. and if you're going to sell 25 different genetics in your store, then 150 grams of, 20, of, four, of 25 different uh, 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 strains is going to mm -hmm. be not that much. 
you sure. know? But, uh, but, but you've got to keep it in a jar and you've got to keep it, you know, yeah, in, yeah, in some... Yeah. Now, what do you, what do you, what's your opinion on uh, Baveda packets or in, what's the other uh, company that makes the other one? The, uh, the ones... Inte Integra Booster. Yes, Integra Booster. What's your opinion on those? Everything that you can use to make uh, the quality of the bud better and last longer is always something that you want to have. You know, it, it, of course, we don't really need that kind of uh, products uh, when we are storing the products in our own facility because we will just store it in a room that has that perfect temperature and humidity already anyway. And uh, for example, yeah, uh, for example, there is, you know, when we're looking at packaging, because this is a, a very, very difficult topic because you want to use as much as possible recycled material. You know, you want to, yeah. you want to be, you want to be, ah, oh, there you go. <laughs> but, but, honestly, there is, there yeah. is really nothing <laughs> in mind, but it's, yeah. almost it's almost finished it's anyway. It. So, <laughs> yeah. Um, but uh, when you're packaging something and then sealing it, you know, you have uh, uh, possibilities of uh, adding a little, what is it? Um, it's not carbon dioxide. It's something that basically uh, uh, improve, helps the freshness of the bud to last a little bit longer. And if you're using, for example, bamboo plastic, which is mm -hmm. uh, uh, is breathing, then and and you put it in that bag and it stays in the shop for let's say several weeks before it's sold, then the quality will be different. So right. finding the the right packaging material that is made from as much as possible sustainable material without uh, uh, losing the quality of the flower is is a uh, is I, I've heard people that went to Canada and they were like, oh, I'm in Canada. Yeah, I can finally buy some legal weed. And they get this, they, they, oh, they get this little plastic pot and they open it up and the weed is like old as fuck because it yeah. was, pa it was pa packed uh, like, I don't know, six, seven, eight months ago. Yeah. That's, that's something you want to try to avoid as much as possible. And for that purpose, uh, you can expect that uh, we're going to supply fresh flour every week. Because the shop now has the weird uh, rule that they can have not more than 500 grams, that's a little bit less than a pound, in their shop at all times. When they come and check, you have more than 500 grams, you're fucked. Uh, in the new situation, they will the 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 shop can can show can prove from his sales history how much they are selling approximately in a week, and then they are allowed to order a week's supply. And after that week, they will order wow. again and again and again. And so that means also that we're not doing a huge amount of pre-packaging in our, in our uh, company and then it will be stored and then we wait for somebody to order it. It will be more uh, tailor-made where people are making orders, we will prepare it, we will pack it, and then we will ship it. Because also on, cool. the, on the packaging, there will be written uh, when it was harvested, when it was packed, and when it was shipped, and who did it. And which which farm produced it and which shop is selling it then there, there must be as much information on the packaging for you to decide okay i'm going to take it or not and then in the worst case scenario if you open the package and say okay sorry but this sucks then you can give the package back to the shop they will give you a new one and we will come and pick up the um the buds that have been uh, um, um, uh, um Sorry, I'm I'm I, I'm missing the, the the English word for denied. <laughs> denied. <laughs> I think I think this is not going to happen that often, you know, unless uh, unless there are some farms that are going to produce uh, a sensationally crappy weed. But uh, no, that's not going to happen. I it's, I seriously doubt it. Some sometimes, you know, I'll just go into coffee shops to see if like the manager is there and he's not, and then I'll just you know while i'm there anyway i'll just buy a flower because i'm curious what they have on the menu and what kind of quality it is and once i bought a flower and i i walked out and i opened it up and, and i was like okay it smells like like banana licorice it was a, a tutti frutti or something mm -hmm. but okay this 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 smells so much like tutti frutti it cannot it's almost impossible possible you know, there, is, there, is, there is there is maybe what is it like eight to 16 different turpines that are like dominant in cannabis and that was absolutely not one of them, you know. Yeah. And unfortunately, there was a grow shop around the corner where I know the people, and I know that they have a big microscope on their counter. So I went there and put it under the microscope. And unfortunately, we saw we, we saw something different, but we were not able to determine it to be turpines. 
that was yeah. sprayed on it because we don't we didn't have a reference in what it looked like and then you okay. showed me some pictures and you said okay this one has turbine contamination and it looked Lava. god damn it it looked exactly the same so you get into <laughs> this strange situation where i was in another shop and they had some cherry pie which which is a genetics i really love because it really had this sour fruity sweet smell and taste i was like god damn it, this is super good weed and now suddenly i was thinking did i smoke real weed or did i smoke turbines Mm -hmm. Well, and your nose, I, I just re, I reinforced, uh, re, reinforced, uh, I, I reconfirmed uh, my knowledge base about this in the last week with Max Montrose at the Tricom Institute. And right. I told him, I said, you know, I just finished doing this cup and I sent a couple of photos with them uh, that I showed. And I said, am I looking at this directly under the scope? Because I'm still remembering and, and thinking of this as it being like a, a lava flow. And this, but the real tell is the, the demonstrative aroma profile that is over the top of whatever it is it's supposed to be representing. And he you know, came back to me and said, that is still the number one tell. Your nose is going to tell you yeah. when, and then when you look at it, yeah. It's, you're, it's you've too got, good to be true. Yeah, 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 yeah exactly. Yeah. It's too good to be true. <laughs> yeah, Isn't it? And that's why I enjoy my talks with, uh, with Herbert M. Green, uh, uh, the interpreter, uh, a lot, because, you know, he, he does have some insights on that as well. And he, he changed my perception of how I am, uh, how I'm looking at uh, genetic selection, for example, you know, Excellent. because I, because because uh, um, basically in the Netherlands, only since maybe about a decade, we are starting to understand that there is a difference in effect between an indica and a cyclical, between a narrow leaf and a, and a broad leaf, um, and, and, and because essentially people just buy wheat because they want to get stoned and, and they don't ask that many questions. Do you want to get stoned? Do you want to get high? Me, I was like, okay, you know what? I, you know, for example, during this, I would smoke something more uplifting and more uh, sativa, uh, uh, you know, to, to make sure that I have a little, still a little bit of a clear, clear head. Mm -hmm. But in reality, we're going towards a situation where it's, it's, it's irrelevant if, it's, if something is an indica or a sativa. What is relevant is the turbine profile and the cannabinoid, you know, because yeah. because essentially you will have a situation. Some shops are already uh, thinking about this concept where you will go into a shop and they will have a screen where you can just type in, okay, listen, I'm I'm going to buy some weed because I want to do Netflix, gaming, studying. I still have to go to work. I have to visit my grandma. Yes. You know, uh, I what do I expect? Uh, a long effect, uh, a mild effect. You type all these things in, and then the end, boom, it will tell you maybe you can try this bud or this bud or this bud. Yes. You know? So uh, then, when I'm looking at genetics, and I'm like, okay, you know, I really like to have a San Fernando OG, a San, San Fernando Valley OG, mm. or, or I mm -hmm. love I love cherry pie, or a, 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 a nice uh, uh, OG Kush breath, or something like that. You know, it, but in the end. You can have a really nice uh, OG Kush breath, or you think that somebody has given you an original OG Kush breath uh, uh, genetic. You don't know because it comes from the illegal circuit, so it can be fucking anything. So why not focus more on the turbine profiles that those supposed genetics are going to have, and then focus more on that? So let's forget about okay. indica and sativa and hybrid and indica dominant and stuff like that. Let's look purely at the turbines because that is going to decide the effect in the end. You know. So I'm gonna so, I'm uh, gonna play I'm gonna play a quote which I'll put right in here. I'll add it a little bit later on yeah. uh, in the post editing uh, from Max Montrose. Any plant has a narrow leaf. It's the sativa one. It's just not true. And that any plant that has the broad leaf is the indica one, and, and that that's not true. Because the truth is, there are broad leaf uh, indica Afghanica varieties, and there are narrow leaf indica varieties. That's the truth. Cannabis has this massive spectrum between narrow leaf types and broad leaf types that are both hemp or marijuana, and even outside of hemp and marijuana. So at the end of the day, um, our new chapter in, in, in the new interpreting book that covers this not only explains this in the way that I did, but at the end of the day, what we explain is none of this matters. 
at all because nothing that you're working with is an indica or sativa to begin with. They're so, 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 so far removed from these indigenous plant types in exotic geographies from so freaking long ago that it's irrelevant. Why you're debating so much about speciation on the opposite side of the planet a couple hundred years ago? There was. It's, you know, if, 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 there is, if there is still, you know, like uh, uh, selection parameters that you are using, uh, um, uh, then you can you can say okay listen an indica uh, or a, a broadleaf a cannabis will need less flowering time than a narrow leaf so so commercially practically you're going to say okay listen if if i have a genetics which has a turpine profile which is not specifically unique but it has 13 weeks of flowering and i have right. a, a genetics that has eight weeks of flowering and has a similar turpine profile I would probably put more effort into that short flowering turpine profile than the long flowering per, uh, profile. Did, did you get a chance to ever take a look at the, I think when we were at the cup, I, I mentioned to you about the uh, uh, ganja grid. A gentleman who has set up the, the grid and he's pumping out the vibration of his heartbeat. Dude, dude. <laughs> yeah, I, I looked into that. Fascinating, fascinating. Yeah, what? I can't wait to see some results. I want to see the results of what he's doing. For the, for the viewers, if, explain explain the concept. Okay, so the the whole idea is that basically he has set up a wire gridding system, a regular gridding system where you grow the plants, but he's pumping through not electricity but vibration from music, and he's got uh, different types of music and and even his heartbeat which he sends through uh, the, the vines. And what he's doing is, is showing a demonstrative difference and effect of different sounds and different music on the plants. And he's in the middle of a bunch of different studies and he's been selling these things, I guess, left, right, and center. And what I had mentioned to you was the fact that after I did the show, because uh, I'm not a grower, so I didn't know if it's, you know, it's this, hoodwinks is you know uh, 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 witchcraft what is he doing <laughs> I got a ton of longtime growers that contacted me and said he is exactly correct what he is doing though is not what you're thinking it's not just the thing but he is connecting with each one of his plants through that heartbeat or through the, the thing, just like a grower does when he is with his plants. And if you exactly. see any great grower, he's connected to his plants, usually in a very personal way, might have a name for each one of the plants or, you know, and that's the more that you have with that. And that was when you told me and started saying, that's why you guys made your, 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 some of your spaces smaller. Uh, yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, yeah. More personal attention. It's, it's, in the end, it has to do a little bit also with uh, nostalgia. Um, uh, it's okay. Oh. It's it, uh, it's a long story, but I'll try to keep it short. Um, okay. But um, we used to have a time in the Netherlands, which is like end of the '90s, beginning of uh, 2000s, where basically, if you were growing weed at home, uh, you would not be, get kicked out of your house. You would not get uh, like a huge fine from a tax company or something like that. You would just get probation and maybe 1,000 to 1,200 euro fine. So uh, everybody that was looking for a way to make a little bit of extra money went into a grow shop and said, hey, listen, uh, I want to make some extra money. Can you help me out? Yeah, OK, uh, you need to take this fertilizer, take this soil. Here is, a, here is a number of a guy that can sell you the clones. Here is even a number of a guy from an electricity company that can turn your meters back so you're not paying too much on your electricity bill and stuff like wow. that. And when the weed is finished, don't go somewhere on the street to try and sell it. Come back to me. I'll give you a fair price and I'll make sure it ends up at the right place. Wow. And we, so we had a situation where a lot of people, we called it honest weed because the, those people were growing the weed on soil, well flushed because the grow shop was helping them with, with tips and tricks to make sure that the weed would be as, as good as possible with a decent quality. And it would be just simply honest. So in those days, we had the best possible weed 
in, in the Netherlands. You know, if you would end of end of 2000, you would go into a coffee shop in Eindhoven, you would be able to get something grown on soil and well flushed and well cured because they were taking care of it. But as soon as things became more criminally cross prosecuted and the risk became bigger, all those people that were just growing to get some extra money, they stopped because they don't want to get kicked out of the house. They have family. So basically organized groups, commercial growers took over and let's say the middle class of growers completely disappeared. And you only have the hobby growers that are doing it for themselves and the people that are doing it for financial gain. So you can imagine people are doing it for financial gain that their motives are not necessarily in giving you the best possible quality unless it's their sales argument. And uh, what we are doing, we are from that age. We are from that generation of growers. So instead of you doing a massive haul, you know, we prefer to have smaller grow rooms because we are used to working in smaller grow rooms and giving each plant that, that personal attention that you want. If, if you look at the, the Aurora farms in, in, in Canada, for example, uh, friends of mine, uh, the Dhaka couple from South Africa, uh, Jules and Myrtle. Jules was- Yes, was, I've was, met them. Yeah, Jules, Jules was killed in a, in a robbery, unfortunately, uh, uh, two years ago, three years ago, which was horrible. But they went after they got the legalization in, in South Africa done, they were invited to Canada to, to visit Aurora. And I was like, okay, how was it? And they were like, you know, what the fuck? When we were, when we were fighting for legalization, this was not what we had in mind. A fucking factory with thousands and thousands of plants that are basically being planted and they just grow and they do nothing except harvest. So, so there is no lollipopping. There is no... Uh, uh, what we, we call it topping, where you basically, uh, the main bud, you give it a little squeeze so that you get yeah. two out of it and then you squeeze it again. You get, nothing was happening. This is just mass production. That's not what we want. And, and we are, because this is our, uh, our heritage, our history, this is our expertise. We are going towards that method of growing, not only because that's the way we know how to do it best, but also because of the nostalgia. You know, because it's a big, a big part of, of, of smoking weed is not only the effect of cannabis, uh, of, of, of turpines and cannabis weeds, but it's also uh, the emotional attachment that you have to it. You know, it's also exactly. part of the effect. You know, it's not only, it's not only the uh, numbers and statistics and analytics and stuff like that. So, so this is also the reason why we, uh, why we took this approach. Also, practically, if I have a gigantic hall and I have mil powdery mildew on one side, then I have a problem in my whole room. And if I have a smaller room and something is happening, then I can contain it within that room and all my other units have no problem. Right. You know, it's, it's, it's also pure practical. But uh, um, what is interesting actually, I know that you know, we have schematics and, and, and drawings and everything for our sewer system, for the age fact, where the electricity is, uh, the places where you can wash your hands and you know follow the hygienic uh, 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 rules, but mm -hmm. it can be interesting to put like a small sound system in each grow room as well, huh? and play music. Why not? There you go. Why well, not? and I and I think that he's got it has to do with the connection of what he's doing because it's there's an actual uh, connection to the plant because you can see the leaves vibrating, you know, to the beat of his heart. And uh, to the sound of the, the, he's got the monks chanting, you know, oh, oh. he's also <laughs> playing, he's also playing some heavy metal. I told him, I said, how come the, you don't start off every morning with kickstart my heart? You know, now, hey, you well, know, let's go. <laughs> ima imagine if you find out that a good kush grows best if you're playing uh, K-pop all day, very loud. <laughs> and then, it's, then, it's, then, I'm, then I'm going to be really fucked up if I have to work in that room the whole day and I have to listen to that music as well. <laughs> oh my God, that'll change some careers. Okay, Patrick, today you're working in the heavy metal room. Uh, uh, Frank, you're working in the classic room today. <laughs> I am very interested to see what is going to be the results of this. I do think that there are going to be some results that are going to show a demonstrative difference between different types of sound and different types of music. And I, I really truly think that, you know, country music, uh, you know, might work great for this type of cultivar, but not for this.
you will, you will, that, that's something that you can, honestly, you can really only test it if you are in a legal environment, huh? because then you will also have the possibility, because when we finish a product, then we are allowed to analyze it. So then we can look at differences. Then we can see between different batches of the same genetics if there is a variation in the turpine profile or in the cannabinoids or flavonoids or whatever. So that's going to be interesting to, to try out because you did you ever hear of this uh, Japanese artist that made pictures of water uh, on a microscopic level? And he was making pictures of the water when he was shouting to them, when he was laughing, when he was playing music. And then you see that the molecules form a different pattern depending yeah. on which which uh, uh, vibe they were getting uh, externally. And it's very simple. We are made 80% of water. Plants are probably 80% of water as well. So there is, if there is a huge amount of water in it and water changes its structure depending on what it's hearing, then of course it's going to have some sort of... Effect. There you go. Bring it on. I can't, I can't wait to see the result. Um... <laughs> I can't wait to see your result. You know, I, I am, you know, again, I've been hearing well, about this story for don't, don't years. Don't worry, now. we're going, we're going to participate in those cups now. <laughs> for Outstanding. Sure. For sure. I, 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 you know, I want to have, I want to have opinions from you and all those other people that are judging and that have some sort of knowledge or expertise about genetics. Of course, I want to have your opinion. Especially, I want to have your opinion if something is not what you're expecting because that's something you learn more from and if everybody says yeah it's fantastic sure yeah you know so bring it on i'm excited for you dude i yeah. wish uh, i wish i could just move up the time uh you know and speed up the clock but uh i think you're on you're on the right path man and uh i think that uh, the country should be uh, uh the city should be pretty thrilled to, to have you uh in there it's cranking the wheels I, I, you know, when I when I put my first seeds in the ground somewhere in 1985, you know, I would have never imagined that I would be today in a position where I can say, okay, uh, uh, next year I'm going to sell legal weed. I, I, I can I can I can tell my grandchildren, you know, when they're smoking the first joint, I can tell them I was there when the first legal weed was produced, you know, and they will say, yeah, shut up, grandpa, that. don't give us your boring stories about the past, we don't fucking care, <laughs> you, you've been smoking with tobacco all your life, you, you're, you're blasphemy, <laughs> what I'm looking forward the most to is, you know, that, you know, you've produced something, you know, you've put some hard work in it, it looks nice, it smells good, it has the effect that you're expecting, and then you can say to people, look what I have, look what I have, you know, come, come, come to our farm, check it out, smell it, taste it, you know, and, and then you just bring it to the people, you know, if it, for example, uh, tomorrow I am in Amersfoort on the Stony Hawk Cup, which is uh, a skate contest, but they have this whole uh, hip hop and smokers community on the side. So they're combining skate with music and, and smoking culture and everything. And I'm going there for the simple fact that the people that are uh, going to go into the shops and buy our products eventually are going to be there. You know, I want to talk also with the people that have what expectations do they have from the weed that we're going to produce. I know this already from the coffee shops. I spoke with all of them. But what about the end consumer? It, do they have prejudice? Do they have a negative view of what's going to happen? Or are they excited? Are they, uh, what is there, what are they anticipating? You know, so I want to get in touch with like the, the, the people that are going to buy it eventually just as well. You know? What kind um, of feedback have you been getting so far? What's the number one concern people are having? That it's grown by people that don't know what, what they're doing. Okay. That is, that is state weed. And, and people that have uh, tasted the medical cannabis that is not produced by the state, but by a state appointed farm, it's not fantastic, you know. There's a lot of people that prefer to buy their medicine in the coffee shop rather than buy that stuff from Bedrocom. You know, I've seen very nice buds from from Bedrocom as well, but I've also seen complete garbage. And it's it's basically for some reason people at this moment have more confidence in the 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 weed that is coming from the black market than a weed that is produced legally. Because, oh, it's produced legally, of course, it's going to be more expensive. But the right. reason, the whole reason why weed is expensive at this moment is because it is an illegal product. Mm -hmm. 
you know, the weird thing is that, that in America and in Canada, weed is actually becoming more expensive as it has been legalized, where it should have been actually way more cheaper. You know, that is, that is I, I think that, that is the most feedback I had so far. And even sometimes when I'm in a coffee shop and I explain them what the advantages are going to be, you know, that they have, that they will have weed and hashish from a controllable origin, you know, tested, lab tested and everything. And cheaper than what they have now, and they go, oh wait a minute, oh okay, maybe there is actually a light at the end of the tunnel. We didn't expect that, and I, I, I be, because you know I've, I've been in the industry now for like over twenty years, and I've been all over the world for my work, uh, working for uh, BioVis, the, the organic plant food the company. I have I have people in Germany that are already sending me messages. When can I come to Holland to buy your product? Uh, and in which town can I buy it? And in which town I cannot? I have people that say, hey, listen, I, one of those wheat factories is going to be in my town. Does that mean that I can go to the shop in my town and buy that legally produced wheat? No, sorry, dude. You can only buy it in the 10 towns that are participating in the experiment. You know, And we're also hoping that when we start the experiment and you will see, and you can noticeably see that people from other cities are especially driving to Tilburg or Maastricht or whatever to buy that legal weed, that those towns will say, hey, Mayer, what the fuck are you doing? We want to be part of the experiment as well. And that during the, those four years, the amount of cities that are participating in the experiment is going to grow exponentially. That is going to help us at the end of the four years of the evaluation to say, okay, this has been a success. Let's do it nationwide. Bring it on. You know, I and, think then, be awesome. and then finally, <laughs> Netherlands can take back their rightful place in the cannabis top three of the world. I'm looking forward yeah. to that because yeah. I think uh, because I think somewhere right now we are. It's a weird, it's a fucking weird situation, and where basically you can get weed in a lot of places. You're allowed to have it. You're allowed to consume it. And we didn't take care of business in the right way. And we're basically still yeah. smoking crap. You know, we're, we're smoking, we're smoking Jamaican stuff. <laughs> ah, you know, it's funny because, you know, when I, when, when I had a chance to go down to Spain, uh, you know, I, I told you that I think it was one of the first times that I had a chance to try some of the, the Spanish outdoor uh, yeah. grown buds. And, uh, you know, it, it took me right back to my California days. And it was immediately, I, I went, I was back at this other level of uh, quality and flavor and uh, of full bodiedness that I had been missing. And uh, there's no doubt that right now in Amsterdam uh, and, and in the cup, and even with what we saw, we saw a lot of Spanish buds that were in there that were coming from, uh, okay? So, you know, the market is working the way the market works. Uh, what I've been hearing on the streets is that there's a lot of Canadian buds in, in, in Amsterdam right now. There's a lot of California buds at low uh, uh, prices, um, but uh, mostly it's, it's Spanish buds that have yeah. been coming in uh, at an overwhelming, uh, basis. Do it's, you it's, think that, it's, it's, that we've lost? Also, sorry, sorry. It's, it's also because a lot of the Dutch growers that didn't want to give up their growing when the when the uh, rules when the laws changed here in the Netherlands, they just moved to Spain and then continue, continued over there. And they still have their same connections to uh, suppliers, to coffee shops, back doors, and stuff like that. So that's that's one of the reasons. You know, it's yeah. not. It's not the Spanish wheat grown by Spanish people that comes to the Netherlands. It's mostly Spanish wheat grown by Dutch people. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's my personal opinion. Yeah. Sorry. Your, your question. I went through. No, 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 no. Well, you know, it's, it's again, we're, we're, I, I, you took me into another uh, thought process here because I know there's a gentleman who's coming here to the Netherlands in the next couple of months or within the next month or so, uh, who I also interviewed. Somebody you should know. His name is Russ Hudson. And he is one of the world experts on the Spanish uh, coffee shop uh, markets for years and years and years. He ran right. a business that was there in town where if you were trying to get into a one of the associations in Barcelona or Madrid or anywhere, he had a group that was doing that. Most recently, he wrote the big book of Terps, 
which is most pinpoints uh, into your uh, alley. Uh, he is he is a walking textbook on all of it, and he's going to be here in the Netherlands in the next month or so. And I think he's going to be here for a couple of months. So when he's here, make sure I'll try and get you guys uh, together so you can have a, a chat with him. He's nice. Yes, he's Cause, he's. Cause on, cause honestly, you know, I, I I don't know that much about turpines yet. You know, I'm I'm starting to read more into it for the simple fact that I have to make choices uh, as regards to the genetics um but exactly there was there was never for me a necessity to really go in depth into these kind of things for the simple fact that i worked 15 years for an organic fertilizer company so all the flour that i was getting from people was homegrown square meter completely fully organic and grown with love so i never had to question what the quality of the bud was or the turpine profile or whatever because i didn't right. care it was organic if, if you're competing in a fierce competitive American market, you need to find ways to, to differentiate yourself from others. So then you're going into, okay, where, to which de extent of detail can I go to show people how I am different than, uh, than other people? So it's, right. it's, it's basically, it's, it's the market that decides the amount of knowledge that people are getting into. And now that we are going, going on the same path, yeah, that means also that, uh, you know, I have, to, I have to discover if it's really possible to still teach an old elephant new tricks. Yeah. Well, I think that's the important part, though, you know, because, you know, then your next step after your terpenes is you got to get into the cannabinoid protocols. <laughs> now you got to now you get into the cannabinoid protocols. And now we're talking about idiosyncrasies amongst each one of the cannabinoids within each one of the cultivars to affect whatever it is that ails you. So I'm, I'm depressed. I have this. I have this kind of problem. I have that kind of problem. Yeah. Well, yeah. there's certain cannabinoids that work very specifically on those things. And that's becoming a mass business in North America where, uh, uh, yeah. you know. But that, that's also what we need. That's what we need for recreational use as much as for medicinal use. You know? Medicinal, yeah. We, we, there, there, there are still enough situations where people respond badly to specific genetics because say okay if i smoke this kind of weed it gets me paranoid why is that is it mm. because of this turpine or is it because of this cannabinoid or is it because of this or because of that you know when we when we stop uh, when we stop keeping cannabis on the list of illegal substances we are blocking the development of genuine knowledge uh, of how we can use this to our advantage you know exactly and you are at the front line right now dude <laughs> dude and then, and then i'm not even the biggest expert on it or whatever you know so no I'm, 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 no but you're there i am i'm a lucky bastard i'm seriously yeah. <laughs> well and, but you know, I'm a, I, I have to admit you know there are some times where i'm also like god damn it now because it's essentially um I still we still have to wait a year more than a year before we can start selling so you know of course there's a lot of stuff to do during that process but yes. for example coffee shops are like listen you know in 2017 they, they came with this plan you know in 2020 we did the lottery to decide which farms it was going to be uh, then we had to wait another year before the first ones even got authorization clearance to continue now we the, the farms are still building uh, they say you know what patrick don't don't visit me anymore just come when you have flour and when you have prices and before yeah. that time listen sorry i'm busy enough you know? yeah. uh, at this at this moment the, the the let's just say the level of motivation amongst the, the 74 shops is relatively low because they're mm -hmm. thinking okay if it's going to be postponed until the end of next year who is who isn't going to say that you know what okay there is another problem we're going to start in 2025 yeah well and this gives you you get a year to get all of your act together it gives you a chance to make sure that those packages are going to have at least some part of transparency in them so that you can know the size of the buds in them and all those little idiosyncratic you know yeah, bullshit yeah. things you know you can you've got that time to kind of knock all those things out before so when you hit the ground you should be boom yeah off. exactly exactly we will hit the ground running that's what we're working on already right now yeah absolutely so yeah. because essentially as soon as the roof is on as soon as the lights switch on 
you will have to have your genetics ready, you know, because we there's also this this guideline or this this uh, 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 requirement. We have two weeks, a window of two weeks, to extract one thousand plants from the illegal market because it's basically still illegal. Uh, from the illegal market, get it into our farm and then start working with that. We we do have the the possibility to introduce seeds whenever we want during those four years. But basically, we are, we are working now on an organization on how are you going are we going to get thousand plants with the genetics that we want exactly within a window of two weeks inside our farm. And then, of oh, they, course, they couldn't have made it any more difficult. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, because basically uh, all those preparations are uh, uh, illegal. On paper, they are just illegal. If, if let's, let's just say, if I decide to dedicate a room in my house to cultivate, uh, let's say, 30 mother plants to getting them ready for going into the farm uh, uh, next right. year, and then and they catch me, they kick me out of my house. I'm fucked. Oh, God. So it's, <laughs> yeah, but hey, listen, uh, change has never been easy, you know? So uh, ask, ask Nelson Mandela. <laughs> yeah, okay, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> wow. You, you, had, you had to wait for a this long time. Huh? So, so I know, but still, it seems like they would at least made the path for you a smoother path since it's their idea. Essentially, it's their, you know, they, they should have made it. We're just going to fucking do it. And, and honestly, okay, you know, maybe it's good that they don't make it easy on us because then we would maybe be not, not uh, uh, appreciating the gravity of the situation as much as we do now. You know, there needs there needs to be some some awe and some respect for the fact that this is finally going to happen in the Netherlands. It's not a small thing. You know? you know, no, uh, it's a big deal. And this is progress. Yeah. This is yeah. big progress right here. And it's something that hasn't happened here forever. Um, and, you know, it's the there's a lot riding on this. And, and you know, I feel a lot better knowing that you're there. Uh, Thank and, you. Uh, it, I, I really do, but it was all seemed like it was all this big clusterfuck, and it's and you know <laughs> it's obviously uh, you know it, I understand a lot more about what's going on now behind the scenes and uh, uh, knowing you and knowing what you know your experience. The, I, I think we're in good hands. Don't don't un underestimate the Dutch. Eh? We are we are experts in making clusterfucks. <laughs> so, <laughs> listen, so, it, it ain't it ain't over for, for the fat lady things. Eh? So, but yeah, yeah, we're we're really on the way, and and you can expect that, uh, especially somewhere in the middle of next year, there is going to be all kinds of samples from all kinds of different farms that are already testing and doing stuff that will be uh, available. Uh, to specific people or whatever you know uh yeah so i'm looking i'm looking forward to the to the day that i'm going to uh, uh sorry that i'm using a glove to put a nice <laughs> flower that i'm using putting a nice flower in your hand and then you're going to test it for me and then you're going to give me your opinion I'm, dude I'm i cannot one. wait i All cannot right. wait Thank you so much for everything that you've done and for Thank what you, for you are me. doing. And uh, and I definitely we want to have you come back on and and catch up as you're getting closer to launch day. And then uh, yeah. uh, you know I think we got to do some sort of a party or a launch day or something because that's that's going to be a, a historic day. Maybe we can make it a new National Cannabis Day, <laughs> the day of best parents. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Okay, well, it, it, I'm looking forward to, to continue our relationship and talking about stuff. And uh, thank you very much. It honestly, it was it was a pure coincidence that we bumped into each other uh, on the Jack the Cup, but it has, has been absolutely super valuable. Thank you very much. Yeah, it's my honor. Thank you, sir. I appreciate it, and we'll see you in a couple months. How do and bedank. Ah. All right. Well, there you go. You guys are now all up to date on the experiment here in the Netherlands. Congratulations, you now know more about the experiment than most people. <laughs> well, I'm going to continue to do a little inhaling and exhaling and holding here, and I will see you next week with a brand new Wake and Bake with Captain Hooter. Inhale, hold, exhale. <sighs> yes. <sighs>
It's Captain Hooter. Far out, man. <laughs>